Um, it's a, a pleasure to welcome you to another curatorial conversation at the Warburg Institute in London. And as you may know, I'm Bill Sherman, uh, the director of the Institute. And just by way of background, we started this series a couple of years ago now to provide a showcase for the most interesting exhibitions and other museum projects, sometimes whole museums or gallery projects, rehangs, renovations of buildings. Uh, but also to give our audience a behind the scenes glimpse of the activities of leading curatorial colleagues. And of course, during the last 18 months when travel was so restricted and so many great shows went largely unvisited, particularly international uh, visits, um, we've increasingly found ourselves using this platform for paying a virtual visit to really important shows that we didn't want to miss, but that we figured we would be unable to see in person. And this evening's event ticks all of those boxes. Uh, we're really fortunate to feature an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in New York called Afterlives, Recovering the Lost Stories of Looted Art, which runs all the way through uh, early January of 2022. So hopefully at least some of you will have a chance to see it. Um, now, back in late August when the show opened, I started reading amazing reviews of the show. I don't think I've ever seen so many reviews using I left with my head spinning or I left in a daze. Um, I mean, these are these are really unusual uh, reviews and they were so interesting and so deep that I, I wanted to learn a bit more about the show, even uh, if or, or indeed, especially if the trip to New York was going to be impossible. Uh, but there are two other reasons quickly why I did rush to, to reach out to the exhibition's curators. The first is because they, like us here in London, work in a house built by the Warburg family. Um, the Jewish Museum occupies a beautiful building in the Upper East Side uh, that was once the home of our founder, A.B. Warburg's younger brother, Felix, and his wife, Frida Schiff Warburg. Um, the second reason is, of course, for those of you in the know, that the name of the show, Afterlives, invokes perhaps the single most important word in A.B. Uh, Warburg's uh, research and writings, uh, afterlives or Nachleben in the native German uh, is everywhere in Warburg's work and very resonant in this particular show. So it really felt important to feature this show at the Warburg Institute and I'm very grateful uh, to welcome the exhibition's prime movers, um, at least briefly, I know she has to go um, early, but Chief Curator uh, Darcy Alexander and also Assistant Curator Sam Sakharov. Now, Darcy and Sam will quickly give us an introduction, a kind of walkthrough uh, for the show before they answer some questions, first from me and then from you, and we will shoot for wrapping it up within about an hour. Now, um, Darcy and Sam, thank you so much for coming and uh, congratulations again on this important show. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. And you're absolutely right on the on the title choice. And I'm going to in a moment just punt that over to Sam because he was the one that came up with that connection to the uh, to the Warburg context and story with the Nachleben reference. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought what I might do is is uh, just give a little bit of a background on how we came to this theme. Um, and then and then sort of start maybe with a few slides with Sam and then unfortunately I have to depart. But um, so, you know, just, just a little background both on myself and the Jewish Museum. So um, I've been at the Jewish Museum for about three years. Sam is pushing two. Sam, how many years are you, have you been with us? I think I hit the three month mark in about, or three, three year month in, a, in three about year a month. Three year mark. <laughs> time, is, time is a very nebulous concept these days. Um, but uh, shortly after I joined the museum, um, coming from a contemporary art background, I'd been at the Walker Art Center out in Minneapolis and started my career at, at MoMA. Um, I felt like I really needed to understand the, um, the identity of the institution as a Jewish museum. So I spent a lot of time my first year just rifling through um, the historical record at the Jewish museum and also just was paying a lot of attention to the news because we get our ideas out of the news and we're looking at reading the newspaper in and out on our long commutes to the city. And it just struck me that there were many, many cases, restitution claims that were making the um, making 
the the news coverage that year. I think it was around the time that the big Gurlitt find was uh, revealed. And um, it just felt like somehow it just felt like the right time to do, um, I should, I don't want to use the word another looted art exhibition, but 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 an exhibition that really looked at this broad theme within the constraints of being at the Jewish Museum, which as Sam will talk about in a little bit, had a particular history and relationship to the recovery effort. Um, so, so that was kind of the 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 broad context of the um of the thinking through and identification of, of the theme. The, the notion of afterlives kind of comes out of this idea that, of course, it's a, it's a Vorbergian idea, but it's an, also an idea that you really, um, one is, is very much struck by in the process of researching artworks, which is that when you look at a work of art, if you look at any object, you, you can analyze it from everything that it delivers from, you know, a, a, a visual and uh, formal or, or uh, intellectual space. But often when you dig under the surface of that object, you see how it lived, as it were, many other realities. And in fact, um, the basis on which we interpret those works of art is very much shaped by those different realities and contexts of the pieces experienced over time. In other words, you can even think like every time you put an object in an exhibition, you're creating a new story for it. You're creating a completely new understanding for that thing. So I guess I, um, my, my opener is to say that like we had an idea that related both to the Jewish Museum's background and to what was happening and remains current in the news media vis-a-vis -vis restitution. But there was also like this other art historical impulse, which is to help um, a certain kind of visual literacy, if you will, penetrate beyond like the surface qualities of an object to reveal all of those various layers of its history, even its history as a document, or one could say an object that's borne witness to history. Um, in a way that we thought of as being uh, novel or unique. So um, with that, I'm wondering, Sam, do you wanna add to the, to the knock label and then just open up the slide deck and we can do as much as we can and, and then I'll yeah. pop out and let you take over? Yeah, so um, of course, um, knock label, um, as, as your audience certainly knows, uh, has sort of two connotations, uh, both afterlife um, and survival. And both of those terms are uh, evocative in the context that Darcy was describing around looted art. Um, and as you mentioned kindly, um, uh, we felt that uh, we feel particularly close to Varberg, to Abby Varberg, because of his family's connection to, to the, um, the Jewish Museum, which as you mentioned, um, was the childhood home of Felix Varberg, was donated by Frida Varberg um, to the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is the parent institution of the Jewish Museum. Um, and so we still, you know, all of our exhibitions to one degree or another feel like they are participating in that lineage. And um, we really wanted to take the, this opportunity with this show to really um, engage uh, really quite deliberately. Um, as Arzi was saying, the notion of afterlife um, in the context of, of our show, there are many threads to it. One of them, one of the threads has to do with the way an object um, to use some, some Varbergian, Varbergian language, uh, the way an ob objects or images move through time and space. And as they do, they accrue pathos. Um, and that pathos um, becomes uh, very much part of the content. The, the work becomes a carrier of pathetic content. And when you're dealing with a, a moment of trauma, like the, like the Holocaust and the stories of loss and restitution, um, that trauma and that pathos uh, becomes very specific indeed. And so uh, a lot of the show is, is sort of about um, both the historical threads of these specific objects that we, sh we can talk about, but also about that, that larger or more general pathetic content that they become sort of um, carriers of, of pathos. Um, here is uh, the opening gallery of the show. And what, we'll, what we do in a number of cases is we reunite works that have hung together uh, earlier in their um, histories um, in specific places. These two works on the right, a work by Franz Marc, on the left, a painting by Max Pechstein, both hung in, the, in London's New Burlington Galleries in 1938 during the first so-called anti-Hitler exhibition. 
staged one year after the very large um, exhibition of degenerate art in Munich and in direct response to that show. Um, after that exhibition, the two works had very different histories. The Franz Mark travels to the US where it's part of a touring version of that anti-Hitler exhibi exhibition titled uh, Banned German Art. And the work on the left, Max Pechstein's um, uh, landscape from 1912 was returned to its owner, Hugo Zimann, who had fled Germany, was living in Paris, then fled to Brazil. And this is one of the paintings that was um, stolen from Hugo Zimann, uh, a close friend of Stefan Zweig, of um, Albert Einstein, a really remarkable man. And uh, it's a pleasure to show this and an honor to show this for a number of reasons, one of which is that this work was restituted to the heirs of um, Ugo Zimon on this past July. So as we think about the movement of works through time and space, the way they accrue meaning, uh, we also are thinking about how, and again, to Darcy's point, how recent and raw some of those uh, layers of meaning uh, remain. And in this case, there's a sort of layer of pathos or meaning that has accrued to this work as recently as July. Darcy? Yeah, do you wanna to jump to the next slide? Um, maybe we'll go just to the Rose Holland. So um, before I jump off, I, I did wanna um, kind of explain a little bit about the organizational principle of the show, because all these ideas can be quite abstract. So, so how we turn this afterlives concept or this notion of art traveling through time and space into something tangible is that we looked at the collecting points and the recovery centers that sort of helped us anchor sort of specific moments in chronological time. And this room actually is, is uh, it's not a, you couldn't say it was a recovery center per se, but it was a storage depot used by the Nazis in the Jus de Palme gallery. Um, and many of you probably know the story of Rose Valland, who was a, a, a registrar and a curator who kept very copious notes of the inflows and outflows of works that had been uh, pillaged from uh, French collections in particular. Obviously, Paris was a huge um, center for Jewish collectors um, with the Rosenbergs, Alphonse Kahn, David David Weil. Wildenstein family, many, many very wealthy Jewish families with very abundant art collections were, were in Paris and the Nazis uh, were uh, free, freewheeling or freewheeling pillaging um, throughout the city with many of these works going back to the Jus de Palme as a kind of hub or a space where they were contained and held. And some were eventually selected to go into personal collections of members of the Nazi leadership. Other works were presumed destroyed and still others uh, were, were eventually uh, found and restituted. So we kick off the show by trying to establish one of the core themes, which is like looking at specific sites that works had passed through together. And I, to, to the point that Sam said at the beginning with that Pechstein and the Franz Marc painting, like there is this idea of sort of work kind of seeing each other again, existing again in the same space. So all of the objects that are in this um, installation shot, which is kind of the first full gallery that you get when you come into the show, several of them are depicted um, in the blow up photograph, which personally is a technique that I really loathe, but it worked very, very well here. It's, I, made, we, I think we made an exception because it's just, you know, you have to find these tropes that are going to engage people. And as soon as people walk in, they know but they have to look for the works that are in the image and it immediately gets them connected to the content in a very visceral, physical way. So with that, I'm afraid I have to jump to another meeting, but I'm gonna listen for another few minutes while Sam takes over. You're in great hands and, um, and then I'm gonna bow out. That's great, Darcy. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you again. Um, yeah, and to pick up where uh, Darcy left off, um, you'll notice that um, this incredible uh, Cezanne, uh, uh, bather uh, and rocks, which was looted from Alphonse Kahn, the uh, model for Monsieur Swan in, in Proust's uh, In Search of the Last Time, is indeed visible in the blow up here with its packing materials uh, still fixed to its corners. Um, you can see it uh, better in this detail. Those packing uh, materials are again a sort of um, evocative of, of the Warburgian notion of, of afterlife and movement of images um, through time and space. Um, not only carrying meaning with them, but also taking on meaning in this case. 
Um, the other two works that you that we are able to um, reunite in this gallery is this work by Federer Lowenstein uh, and this small uh, 1929 surrealist painting by Picasso. Um, the Picasso also looted from Alphonse Kahn. And you can see them here in this installation shot. So the first time, this is the first time those works have hung together since that photograph was taken by the Nazis in 1942. And again, there's a resonance that results. There's a kind of uh, uh, pathetic charge shared by those three images uh, uh, when you encounter them on the wall, having seen them in the, in the photograph uh, uh, at the Jus de Palme. The other two works that uh, we should point out in this gallery are these two incredible uh, works by Matisse. Um, they were both stolen from Matisse's gallerist and friend, the, um, the French Jew Jewish uh, collector and gallerist Paul Rosenberg. Rosenberg had a gallery in Paris, one of the epicenters of modern art in France. Uh, he then would flee to New York, uh, arriving in 1940 with the assistance of Alfred Barr, director of MoMA, but um, um, much of his inventory was indeed stolen. Um, here are the paintings up close. Um, they were pillaged from a home that, that Rosenberg kept in Bordeaux. Uh, there was also a vault that was pillaged nearby. Um, the thefts took place in 1940, 1941. And then these two works indeed traveled together. They travel uh, first from the home in Bordeaux to the German embassy in, in Paris, which was a, a Nazi storage depot, then to the Louvre, again, a storage depot. As you know, they then traveled together as a pair to the Jus de Palme, and then they're both considered for trade. And indeed the work on the left, Girl in Yellow and Blue with Guitar, is chosen uh, by Ermin Goring for his personal collection and travels to his estate in Southwest Germany. Um, they're both re uh, recovered after the war independently, one from France, the other from Germany, um, and then sold independently as a sort of accident of history, they entered the, the collection of the um, Art Institute of Chicago, one in 83, the other in 2007. And again, we're showing them here at the Jewish Museum uh, in a context where all of that history, that sort of shared experience um, is uh, foregrounded. Um, Paul Rosenberg has, has an incredible story that maybe we can address if you're interested in the Q&A period, um, but these works also uh, reflect on his, his story. In the same gallery, you also see the first uh, non-degenerate work in the show that was looted. Um, this uh, incredible painting on the left by Claude Lorraine, uh, uh, 17th century painting titled um, Battle on the Bridge. Um, this is an example of the, the range of looting uh, sort of techniques that were employed by the Nazis. In many cases, the works that we've shown really were pillaged uh, as a result of you know, an SS officer kicking down a door and taking the work. Um, this painting by Laurent, by Claude Lorraine was uh, pillaged through a process of Aryanization. Um, George Willenstein, its, its owner, uh, was, a, like Paul Rosenberg, a major uh, art collector. And his firm, uh, as I said, was subject to Aryanization in which um, he, as a Jew, was forced to surrender control of the firm to a non-Jew, in this case, a friend of his and colleague uh, from before the war who had become a Nazi party member. Um, that friend, former friend, uh, oversaw the sale of this painting at well below market value, uh, what we call in, in sort of a looting context, sale under duress. And it was in fact chosen by um, deputies for Adolf Hitler for his personal museum, the so-called Führer Museum in Linz. Um, and this work uh, in fact has a Linz inventory number on its, on its verso. Um, again, another sort of example of how works as they move through space and time accrue both sort of notionally, but also physically traces and layers of, um, of meaning. Um, I'll also just say a, a word about the exhibition design here, and then we'll move on because I'm aware of time. Um, the, the show, the, the actual space of the exhibition um, is a little bit um, sort of unique. It doesn't, we, we wanted very much to not evoke a kind of white cube uh, sort of static or timeless exhibition space. Um, and so what we did, we employed a number of techniques. One is wrapping walls in burlap, a packing material. Again, speaking to these depots, collecting points, bunkers, uh, these places of, of sort of trafficking and storage. And we also um, punctured uh, some of the walls to return a sense of precarity or risk to the experience of these objects, which themselves have been involved in, uh, like their owners, um, conditions of uh, very severe precarity and risk. Um, um, now we move into the next gallery, which uh, has a couple of different uh, sort of categories of work. There are paintings made by artists in exile, which I'm happy to talk about 
um, at your uh, leisure. But there are also um, uh, drawings um, and other documents that were produced, artifacts that were produced by Jewish um, prisoners in concentration and forced labor camps. Um, it was very important to us to represent that uh, sort of context of creativity um, as part of this show. Um, and you'll also notice in the center of the room, um, uh, one of the most important works in the Jewish Museum's collection. Uh, it is a ledger from the Dachau concentration camp, um, which records uh, over 3,000 names um, of uh, Jewish men and women um, imprisoned at the camp, uh, of, of which only 11 survive. So in a context like this, in a show like this, we are focusing in some cases necessarily on works that survived. That is what is on the wall. Survival is, um, uh, is sort of given precedence, um, you know, for, for material reasons. But all of this um, conversation plays out, needs to say, in the background of irreparable loss. And so um, uh, sort of balancing uh, sort of between those two categories, those two, those two types of fact and experience, loss and survival, is very important to the show. Um, just an example of one of the, the works in this room. This is an incredible charcoal portrait uh, made by a man named Jakob Berenson. While he was um, a prisoner in a uh, forced labor camp in France, um, Berenson had fled from Russia to Germany before the First World War, fleeing the pogroms in Russia, then fled with his wife to France um, in the 30s uh, on a tourist visa, remained in, in France knowing that returning to Germany was too dangerous. He enlisted in the French uh, army when France went to war with Germany and then uh, 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 was uh, interned as an enemy alien. Um, this work is, is very special for, for a number of reasons, not least of which it's full of a kind of empathy and care that uh, Berenson is showing a fellow inmate at the Long Lodge uh, for slaver camp. It also um, includes um, an inscription on the lower left that reads Hildesheimer, the name both of a town and of the uh, prisoner that's depicted, followed by a question mark. And that sense of ambiguity, that um, sort of um, inability to, to identify the sitter more precisely is a reminder of the sort of um, the historical threads that are cut during this period. We're able to, to follow a historical thread or indeed a sort of transit of an object um, through specific points in many cases. But this is a reminder of how many of those paths um, sort of are lost and, and the voices from the past are sort of half heard. Um, they, they exist in a sort of twilight of incomplete memory. Um, and that's a sort of something that we wanted to evoke. The next gallery uh, is part of a, a sort of a hinge to the second act of our story, which is from a uh, sort of shift from loss and looting to restitution and recovery. Um, the, the paintings in this gallery were all processed at what was called the Munich Central Collecting Point. Um, after the war, the Allies set up a network of collecting points to process looted material for return. And many of the works um, on these walls were processed there, including this Corbet, which had been owned by Paul Rosenberg, this fantastic Fantin Latour self-portrait, which had been owned by David David Weil, this incredible uh, Baroque painting by Bernardo Strozzi, which had belonged to um, Oscar Bondi, a Viennese industrialist. And in this space, you'll also see a number of photographs of operations at the Munich Central Collecting Point. Um, and here are some stills. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of the recovery effort um, and really how, uh, how momentous uh, an operation it was and the degree to which it was a direct rejoinder, a very explicit rejoinder to the, the process, the sort of campaign of looting um, committed by the Nazis. The next gallery uh, focuses on the unique role that the Jewish Museum plays in this story. Um, in, uh, in 1947, actually, the same year that the Jewish Museum opens, an organization known as Jewish Cultural Reconstruction is founded uh, and, and uh, uh, legally recognized by the American government as an organization that had the legal right to take control of what was called airless or orphaned property. That is to say, property that had been looted from Jewish individuals or communities who had perished during the war, making it impossible to return that material to them. Unless an organization like the JCR was established, the fear was that that material would be sent back to the nations of origin. And because many of those nations had been complicit in the Holocaust, that was deemed inappropriate. And so the JCR is established, legally recognized in, in 47. And in 1949, the Jewish Museum 
receives uh, um, 83 cases of, of material, some 3,500 objects that we store. Uh, and um, from 1949 to 1952, we facilitate their re redistribution. Again, picking up on this notion of movement, sort of um, the transit of objects, um, and sort of the historical uh, layers that that um, are added in that process. Those objects um, travel to um, Jewish communities uh, around the world. Um, this display is based on an archival photograph of those objects in situ. And I will say that the Jewish uh, cultural reconstruction was administered by none other than Hannah Arendt. Um, like Varberg himself, one of these sort of titans of, of not only Jewish thought, but, but thought in the 20th century. So we are very excited to have that association. Here's another photograph of some of those materials. Again, in situ at the Jewish Museum on 92nd and 5th in, in Manhattan. Um, and here are some of those objects. I'll just draw your attention to these. Um, aluminum tags with the Star of David and the letters JCR attached. Again, material records of this um, incredible history. Um, and now I'll, I'll round things out and we can move on to conversation. This is the first of four uh, works by contemporary artists that we commissioned. Um, this is part of a piece that we commissioned from the German artist uh, Maria Eichhorn. Maria was really excited to focus on the JCR, but less on the ceremonial objects and more on the books. You'll notice that each of these books has not an aluminum disc, but instead a blue and white uh, book plate. Those plates were um, uh, added by receiver institutions who received books by, uh, from the JCR. Um, and there's a very stirring letter written by Hannah Arendt describing the function of the, the plates, which are meant to recall or recollect the, the, their former owners and uh, before they became victims in what, what Arendt calls um, the great Jewish catastrophe. These are all borrowed from institutions in New York, uh, which again is sort of very important to us. Uh, here are two archival documents. Again, just to give you a sense of our association with, with, with Arendt. Um, this is a letter signed by Arendt um, in August um, 1949. Um, again, addressing the, re the receipt by the, the Jewish Museum of those crates of Judaica. And this is one of a number of field reports that Arendt wrote um, while she was uh, traveling through Europe in 49 and 50 principally, searching for, in many cases, hidden, unrecovered uh, Jewish archives and Judaica. Um, so there's another sense in which the sort of restitution uh, process has a very long shadow, a kind of, again, I use this term twilight that, um, that, um, that she sort of uh, engaged in and sort of lived really a, a very important part of her life um, in. Um, this is just another shot of some of those documents as they appear in Maria's um, work. This is a shot of that gallery um, as a whole, so you can see it. Um, these are a few documents. Um, I'll just draw your attention to the, to the map on the right. Um, this was produced in another collecting point. I mentioned the Munich Central Collecting Point. This was produced in the Offenbach Archival Depot, which is a collecting point dedicated exclusively to um, Jewish cultural property. And it's based on a Nazi map that recorded the, the depots and um, to use a euphemism, research institutions um, uh, administered by the, the largest Nazi looting task force, the ERR. But instead of recording paths of loss, this map records paths of restitution. Um, you can see um, in the center, it uh, states um, 2.5 million books. They're in the process of being redistributed around Europe and indeed the world. And then the legend here, book distribution from the Offenbach Archival Depot. And then this very stirring phrase, reversing the flow, started by the Einsatzstab Reisleder Rosenberg. And then I'll just share two works, two other works uh, by contemporaries that we commissioned before opening up to um, Q&A and discussion. These are three paintings by the Israeli artist Hadar God. They're all based on archival photographs of sites of loss or dispossession. Um, on the left, a painting based on the Great Synagogue of Danzig, which is in the process here of being disassembled following its sale by the Jewish community of Danzig to pay for flight visas and other um, uh, documents necessary to flee Poland. Um, this is based on an archival photograph of a uh, synagogue in Amsterdam, the wall of which has been torn open, revealing hidden books inside. And this is based on a ERR storage depot in Poland. And Hadar describes her work as a process of um, excavation or exposure. She applies paint to the canvas, but then spends most of her time with a scalpel, removing pigment, sort of digging up this, um, this earlier moment in uh, her family's history, as well as the history of, of uh, world Jewry, if you could say that. 
And the last uh, contemporary work um, is this uh, actually two works by um, an Israeli um, Palestinian artist named um, Dorgez. Um, these are also both based on uh, his family's connection with this theme. His grandfather and grandmother had been interned during the war in Tunisia um, during its brief occupation by the Nazis in 42 and 43. And I just like to draw attention to these prints in the back, which are um, based on pages from a manuscript that Dora's grandfather kept. He was a playwright and um, a sort of intellectual. And the manuscript was damaged during the transit uh, from Tunisia to Israel. And indeed, the pages that Dora focuses on for this part of his contribution are the pages that bear the trace of that damage. So you have kind of the willed writing of Dorr's grandfather, the artist, and the unwilled writing of the historical event. And they sort of are both parts of the sort of legibility of the work. Um, so I don't want to step on our conversation. Uh, so I'll end there. And I look forward to um, addressing anything else uh, in, in, our, in our discussion. Absolutely. Great, Sam. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh lightning tour um, really makes me even more eager to find some way to get to New York before early January. But uh, in case I don't, let's just tease out some of the uh, other stories and other issues. And then we should have uh, about a half hour for some questions from me and then some questions from uh, anyone in the audience. So I think there are many, many points that I wanted to pick up on. Um, in the presentation that you uh, gave, but also in, in Darcy's comments. And I wonder if we could just start with the point she made very um, almost ironically about another uh, restitution or looted art show. And of course, this isn't the first show to feature this topic. Um, I think in the last two years, I saw uh, two in Berlin alone, including the, the very, very provocative and interesting Gerlit status report uh, collection uh, in Gropius Bau, but had already been in several other museums. Um, and then, of course, the very popular Hannah Arendt show in the German Historical Museum. And I just wonder if you can situate a little bit more fully what you guys were trying to do and how you were trying to do something different from those shows. Yeah, certainly. And, and the Jewish Museum has, has itself done a number of, of looted art shows. We did one on uh, the famous collector, Yastik, or, um, so, and, and we indeed have a, a show on, um, uh, Ed, Edmund Duval is, is, is collaborating with us on a show on, um, based on his bestseller, The Hair with Amber Eyes, that opens in a few weeks. Um, what we want to do with this show was focus on um, less on a single collector or, or theft and more on the processes of both looting and recovery. Um, and in doing so, we wanted to achieve a couple of things. One, we wanted to give um, a little bit more attention to that process of recovery, um, which we feel is, is less often emphasized in, in these debates, or, or not debates, but in these Absolutely. presentations. Absolutely. Um, especially given the, the, as I said, the really, um, incredible role that the Jewish Museum played in that story. It's something that we've never um, presented to our public before. So that really was a sort of um, uh, a very foundational motivation. And then also- uh, and just, what, to, what... just to jump in for a sec, Sam, just sure. for those people who didn't see the Gerlit oh, uh, sure. show, for instance, it does typically feature uh, stories of destruction uh, very, very prominently, but it also focuses almost entirely on unresolved cases of restitution. So open questions in these objects after lives, um, right. orphaned objects, uh, question marks, uh, unfinished histories. And, and it's very striking how much you and Darcy have chosen to emphasize the flip side of uh, survival and recovery. Those words are very prominent in your, in your work. So yeah, I'm glad you, you pick up on that. Yeah, and it's actually one of the, the huge um, sort of honors for us. Um, we, that Pechstein painting that was looted from Ugo Zimon, and I said was what, which was restituted in, in just this past July. Um, yeah, it's a kind of a model of uh, best practices we hope going forward. Uh, that was a close collaboration with the French Cultural Ministry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so uh, um, indeed focusing, we're very aware of the unresolved cases, but also uh, giving attention to the heroic efforts of you know, the men and women who, who really managed the restitution effort, um, we, we felt that that was worth, um, worth attending to as well. 
And the other distinctive uh, aspect of the show, is, as your audience will have noticed, is the commission of, of uh, contemporary artists, which is not, not often done. It's not unprecedented, but it isn't um, often done. And that was, uh, we made that decision as part of a effort to extend this story into the present tense um, by not only, of course, engaging with, with, um, with contemporary artists, some of whom have family connections with this story, but also by um, raising questions about how um, current generations who are very, you know, more and more removed from the events of the war, um, to what degree they are themselves addressed by this history in, in different ways. And we felt that, that the commission of contemporary artists to, to engage with us as collaborators was one way to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I don't know, I'm glad you picked up on both of those points. I think just also to pick up on something that you've said uh, quite clearly and beautifully tonight, but also uh, for those of you who haven't yet seen it, apparently it doesn't exist in physical form. I was lucky to see a, a PDF, but the, the catalog for the uh, exhibition is gonna be published, co-published I think by Jewish Museum and Yale University Press. I highly recommend it, and not least because Sam's amazing essay is a, is a highlight. Um, and Sam's essay um, in particular, I think does pick up on this uh, process of the accrual of pathos, as you said, or the, the picking up of, of la layered time, I think is a phrase you use at mm -hmm. several points in the essay, um, which I found very, very powerful. And again, very Warburgian, given that it, like the Renaissance period, looks both backward and, and forward. Um, and I, I thought you captured that really, really well. But I want to I want to tease out a little bit more, maybe, what the implications of focusing on the life of objects uh, is, rather than what we often refer to, which is either just history of objects or provenance. You know, we often talk mm -hmm. in the art history world of the the provenance of objects, but that leaves them very much possessions, mm -hmm. very much things that are sold and owned and uh, lost and all of that. Um, and sometimes forged and et cetera, et cetera. Um, what did you guys feel you gained by using this biographical? I don't even know if it's a metaphor. Maybe, maybe it's, it's literal. Yeah, no. And I'm, I, I really appreciate uh, the question. Um, and it gets to some of the sort of um, the more kind of ambiguous parts of the, the experience of producing the show, hanging the show, and then experiencing it with, with visitors. One of the things that we were struck by, and we do talk about work, you know, objects in what I think is kind of a provocative way as, as recollecting experiences, as having, you know, we talk about works as, as knowing each other from this earlier moment in their history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all of this, of course, is, is with the proviso that, um, uh, that it's, the, it's the lives of the men and women who owned the objects that, is, um, that deserves the most respect and attention. But in so far as dealing with with works at a, a you know art museum, one of the things that it allowed us, and again thinking about those things of layered time and that kind of thing, is when you stand in front of say that Cezanne, that Picasso, that Lowenstein, you know that they have sort of um, uh, uh, shared space before under very different circumstances. There is a kind of um, an emotional door opens for you, um, and you're able to um, think about the other eyes that have come to rest on, on those works. Um, and you sort, of, you sort of belong to, you enter into a kind of lineage of lookers, lineage of people, a kind of, uh, a kind of company of people who have all looked at those same objects, indeed those same three objects in the case of, of, of you know, re reconstructing that, that photograph. And it does allow for a different kind of connection to, to this, you know, the moment that the that the work that the exhibition addresses, it does allow for a kind of identification with, um, with Kahn, with Lowenstein himself, uh, the artist uh, of of the third work that I mentioned. You you are able to um, to create a kind of pathetic connection to those individuals in a way that a, a sort of cooler presentation might not allow as readily. There is a sense in which you do sort of share. The gallery space, sort of notionally and even and indeed emotionally, with those other people who have seen those objects, and it's very powerful. It's a powerful thing, and it's one of the things that art can do, that an archival document or other kinds of um, records, historical records, maybe can't do as well because they're more yeah. um, 
uh, they're more firmly located in one moment. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, and even there's in your essay, the, the famous case of, of Clay's Angelus Novus, which passes through so many famous uh, owners uh, before finally ending up in, in Israel and uh, you know, on, in, a, in a public collection, which is, right. which is a very potent example. And I would have asked you to talk about that, but I, I'm aware that we're, we're running out of our time to talk. And so I wanted to shift a little bit quickly to uh, another aspect of this uh, challenge, which is, you know, all objects in some ways uh, carry history, uh, accrue pathos, have layers of, of time in them, and, you know, some of them more than others, to be sure, and some of the pathos is certainly more pathetic um, in some cases than in others. Um, but I think there's always a challenge uh, in terms of museology or, or curatorial work or even design work of how you show that, because mm -hmm. putting something on the wall, if you're lucky, maybe having a 50 word label, um, sometimes it just doesn't do it. So how did you guys feel that you were uh, trying to or able to bring these uh, lives to life? <laughs> yeah, um, in a couple of ways. Um, in the case of the of the shoot of palm, sometimes it's a very direct um, reference to, you know, in this case, using a photograph, another moment. Um, in other cases, it's it, it indeed is is the label, or or in some cases, you know, with the um, with the the JCR objects in the Jewish Museum's own collection, it's again through modeling the the um, display on. A kind of um, another sort of uh, space that those that those objects have have occupied. Um, so that that's what I would say. And and there is a sort of sense of, as I said, one of the ways that we we sort of addressed this was to make sure that the exhibition space did not feel static, did not feel like a traditional art space. Um, we could have done more. There, as you, as you'll know, there are. Uh, concerns, budget concerns, things like that. There are all sorts of constraints that come into a planning exhibition. But um, yeah, the use of the the sort of packing materials, the burlap, puncturing the walls, um, having a brushed concrete floor. Uh, there, those were some of the techniques that we used. Um, and then there's also an audio component to the show, which uh, I can't share over Zoom. But there's um, there's an audio recording of RN's field reports being read that plays over the whole show. And so you are hearing in a present tense, um, uh, in, in the present tense, the story of sort of uh, really the difficult story of, of uh, searching for objects and trying to uh, restitute or, or return them. So those are some yeah. of the, the techniques that we used, yeah. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, I'm sure there will be lots of questions uh, from people uh, in the audience. And I'll just remind you all that the, the two ways you can ask a question uh, are to raise your virtual hand um, and using either the reactions button uh, in the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window, uh, you can hit the raise hand icon or sometimes it's in the participants window uh, next to your name or at the bottom. So one way or another, you can make your way usually to some kind of raise your little yellow uh, gloved hand. But um, the other way is if you just want to enter a question in the chat, uh, I will see it and I can read it out to Sam and uh, we can take it from there. Um, so please do, uh, don't, don't hold back. I think you can ask any kinds of questions uh, for, for Sam uh, about this project. But uh, very quickly, while people are gathering their thoughts or, or finding that elusive, and, and it seems with Zoom's interface is ever moving, uh, raise hand button. Let me just uh, give you a chance, Sam, to go back to something you, you mentioned. You said you wanted to maybe come back to the Paul Rosenberg story. I just oh, think right. it's nice to, to tell one story kind of sure. through, through, to through the a end. little bit more detail. Yeah. 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 So after Rosenberg, um, Rosenberg knew that he would be uh, on the top of the list of uh, um, uh, French Jewish collectors whose, whose inventories would be, would be plundered. Um, so he, as I said, had made plans to flee to, to New York, um, uh, but that's not where his story ends. His gallery in Paris, which again had been a sort of epicenter for modern art in France, showing not only Matisse, but also Picasso, Leger, Brock, and others, 
was um, occupied then by the anti-Semitic um, organization, um, the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question. And it's in that gallery, again, where you know, 10, 15 months earlier, you would have seen Matisse, Brock, Picasso, that the largest anti-Semitic exhibition in French history, the Jews in France, is organized. So that's one more example of sort of these ironies of, of um, historical circumstance um, playing out. But the story becomes uh, even sort of more remarkable when Paul Rosenberg and his family are, are crossing the French-Spanish border, his son, Alexander, is pulled from the car because he's still of service age. He spends the war not in the safety of the US with his family, but instead fighting with the free French forces. And then at, during the liberation of France, in late August uh, 1944, uh, Alexander indeed is one of the a, a handful of free French forces that um, intercepts a, fair, a very famous train that was on its way from the Jus de Pomme to a storage facility in Nicholsburg. They thought that the train would be filled with Jewish hostages being used by the fleeing Nazis. But when they threw open the boxcar door, it was full of art, including uh, many works that Alexander recognized from his father's own collection, as well as works by uh, Camille Passaro, and then indeed that Cezanne and that Picasso that I showed you, they were all on that same train. Um, and Marianne Rosenberg, um, Paul's uh, granddaughter, relates this incredible story of her family in our, in our audio guide. So um, that's just sort of pulling the thread on, on the Rosenberg family, very incredible. Yeah. yeah, thank thank you. And in fact, your mention of the audio guide is the, the segue to the first question I have in the chat, which uh, comes from Gabriella Banner. And it's uh, just if you could say a little bit more about the relationship between the exhibition objects and the audio uh, materials that you've uh, prepared. What's the, uh, how, yeah. how, how do they relate to each other? Yeah, so in most cases, thanks for the question. Um, in most cases, um, it's a, it's in some ways a traditional audio guide. So the the audio content on the website is, um, uh, you can certainly listen to it independently. But it's meant to follow the sort of um, the flow of the of the exhibition, and it is cued to specific objects. Um, in addition to Mary Ann Rosenberg, we also have um, uh, contributions from uh, Rafael Cardoso, who's the the um, Great grandson of Ugo Zimon, so um, another heir of a uh, of um, uh, of a collector from whom whom work was stolen, um, and then there's also um, yeah explanatory material uh, about uh, a number of the the objects in the in the exhibition. Um, what is not part of the audio guide but will be part of the website is this um, longer audio file, the reading of of Hannah Arendt's um, field reports, which is something that I was particularly excited about. Um, and so that will be um, that will be uploaded shortly um, with permission from from Rui Eichorn, the artist. Yeah. 